Much has been said in recent weeks about the power of the ChatGPT language model. The hype is absolutely unreal, but is it founded in reality? Let's find out in this video. Now, spoiler alert, what I'm going to show you is that ChatGPT is incredibly powerful. You know, I wanted to hate it. I wanted to say it was total trash, but I can't do that, at least not objectively. There are some limitations. So what we're going to find is that it is pretty good at what I would call general knowledge sorts of questions. It can take a large body of knowledge from the internet and kind of coalesce that, summarize it for you to give you a relatively accurate answer to get you started in your learning process on a particular topic. I think this will be especially powerful for people in non-STEM related fields uh, and of limited utility to those in STEM related fields. Now, where it's going to fall short is in its programming capabilities. So what we'll see is that it's been touted as, you know, sort of a programmer. Now, I don't know how much this is hyped. It could just be the media I'm reading, but I've seen some people claim that it's a, you know, a replacement for programmers, but this is far from the case. It can program, but it does have rather significant limitations, which we're going to show in this video. All right, so here is the chat GPT window. And if you've been playing with this tool, this should be quite familiar to you. So what I've done here is ask it a very basic question is why does deep Q learning require a target network? Now, this is a pretty simple, straightforward question to which it gives a simple, straightforward answer. And it basically says without a target network, the Q network's estimate of the Q values would be constantly changing, which can lead to instability and poor, and poor performance in the learning process. This is absolutely true. And this is more or less the result from the paper. This is what the authors show. So let's see what happens when we ask it why we need a replay buffer. Okay, so it has spit out an answer as to why we need a memory replay buffer. And the basic idea is that one is going to break correlation between consecutive samples, which improves the stability of the learning process. Now, of course, this is necessary for the inputs to a deep uh, neural network to be uncorrelated. That kind of goes without saying. And it says it allows the agent to learn from a wider range of experiences rather than just the most recent experiences which can lead to better performance. This is absolutely true, of course. We store all experiences, and so sampling them at random gives you a broad variety of experiences to draw from. And a uh, corollary of that is it allows the agent to learn from rare or difficult to replicate experiences, which can be useful for learning in complex environments. Uh, and it says, by using a replay buffer, agent stores large experiences, samples randomly, improves stability, allows the agent to learn more effectively. So there's a little bit of repetition there. It uh, it understands, or rather, it regurgitates the core essence of why we need it, but it does some regurg it does some repetition in its language in the process. Not a huge deal. I give this an A. Now I want to see where some of its general knowledge about deep reinforcement learning starts to break down. Let's ask it to summarize the Agent 57 paper from DeepMind published in 2020. So this is actually an interesting result. Uh, when I ran this yesterday, it knew nothing about the uh, Agent 57 paper from DeepMind in 2020. In fact, it told me there was no such algorithm. And I'll put a screenshot of that answer here. Um, so overnight, it has learned that indeed, there is something going on with Agent 57. It's an actual paper. However, it's not entirely accurate. So if you take a look at my recent video where I worked with a group of Ukrainian developers to implement an open source version of Agent 57, you'll know that this only scratches the surface of what makes it a uh, state-of-the-art algorithm. So it's true that it uses a deep Q network with a, uh, a deep Q network. However, it's more accurate to say that it uses a recurrent distributed deep Q learning network. In other words, it builds upon the R2D2 algorithm. It also builds upon the never give up curiosity learning algorithm. Uh, and there's no mention in here of never give up, which is another thing it didn't know anything about. I'm curious to know if it is updated overnight. We're going to take a look at that in a second. But it says a large replay buffer that stores a wide range of experiences to improve stability and learning. Now that just goes without saying that's very trivial knowledge at this point. That's not really summarizing anything useful. What makes Agent 57 so powerful is that it breaks out the um, uh, value function approximators for the uh, critic function for the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards into two separate arms, as well as uh, treating the combinations of uh, beta and gamma hyperparameters as an arm on a multi-arm bandit and using an algorithm at runtime, a microcontroller or a macrocontroller at runtime to select combinations of those hyperparameters and then uses the reward as a signal for that algorithm uh, for that multi-arm bandit to improve its performance over time. 
So you see that it's only really scratching the surface. Uh, it says in, including prioritized replay. Yeah, it uses prioritized replay. Um, and set returns. Yeah, okay, it uses that. No mention of recurrence, no mention of distributed, no mention of the microcontroller, no mention of universal value function approximation for the intrinsic uh, curiosity and extrinsic rewards from the environment. So it's very surface level and not really enough to get you started down the path of true learning. So this is a limitation, though it is a better answer than I received last night. Let's ask it about never give up and see what it tells us. Okay, so yesterday it had no idea what Never Give Up was, and that was probably a clue to the team that they need to uh, at least shore up its knowledge, give it some information about the paper. But again, it's not quite accurate. So it says that uh, NGU is proposed by DeepMind in 2020, correct? Designed to improve sample efficiency of RL agents by making them more resilient to catastrophic forgetting which is when an agent forgets previously acquired skills. This isn't entirely accurate. So Never Give Up works by dealing with the problem of uh, boredom in curiosity learning methods. So in curiosity, the agent is rewarded for exploring previously unseen states. However, over time, the agent will explore most of the state space, and therefore those states will lose their novelty, and the curiosity reward goes to zero. In other words, it gets bored. And so Never Give Up teaches the agent to never give up and to keep exploring those states uh, and to keep trying new state action combinations so that it can find the most optimal strategy over time. Then it goes on to say NGU is based on the idea of preserving previously acquired knowledge by creating a separate replay buffer for each task and using, a, and using an auxiliary network to predict the expected future performance of the agent on each task. I don't, where, I don't know where it's getting the idea of separate replay buffer for each task. So this isn't accurate. Uh, the agent keeps uh, the agent has a single replay buffer that it uses um, multiple different actors to fill up uh, and then it does use an auxiliary network to generate the intrinsic return so it measures the surprise of the agent by uh, using this feature mapping to make predictions about what state it thinks it will transition into given its action and comparing that to the actual transition taken by the environment and the delta between these two gives you this sort of reward for the agent, an intrinsic reward that gives the agent a sense of curiosity. And then it says NGU is able to prevent the agent from getting stuck in poor local minima, which is common in RL. Does this by allowing the agent to return to previously learned tasks and by adjusting the learning rate to speed up learning on those tasks. I don't know where this comes from. Um, I'm actually curious where it's getting this information, but it's not, maybe I had a stroke and totally don't remember the paper, but that's not at all what I remember being in the paper. You know, you could talk about using universal value function approximation to split out uh, the contribution to the total reward from the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards, allowing you to kind of, um, in fact, maybe that's what it's talking about. Um, I think that's kind of what it's getting at is, between these two paragraphs, is the idea of splitting out uh, the networks, uh, the contribution from the intrinsic and extrinsic rewards using universal value function approximation. That's possible. So I think it's just getting confused here. So if you were using this to summarize this and I were, you know, in some alternate universe where I'm your professor and I'm giving you a test and I'm asking you to summarize a paper and you spit this out to me, you're going to fail because it's not correct. It doesn't demonstrate that you read the paper. And then it gives a summary of what it just said. Okay. So yeah, so I would I would again give this an F. It doesn't really seem to know what's going on between uh, going on with the never give up and Agent 57 algorithm. So there is some some limitation to its knowledge. Okay, that's not such a huge deal. Let's see how it does in writing actual code. Now it failed on this last night, so let's see how it does today. Perhaps it's improved overnight. Okay, so I've given it a prompt to write a complete actor critic agent in PyTorch, train the agent on card pull from the OpenAI gym. Now this is fascinating. So uh, it gives me a totally different answer from yesterday, actually. This is neat, it's changing from day to day. So the system is learning and adapting overnight. That's really cool. So it says, I'm sorry, but it would not be possible to write a complete actor critic agent in PyTorch and train it on card pull in this format. That's true, obviously it can't do that. Then it says an AC agent is a type of RL that uses two separate networks, actor and critic, to learn the optimal policy and value function respectively. Requires a significant amount of code and understanding the specific environment problem. However, I can provide you the general outline of what the code might look like. So this is a better answer than what I got yesterday. It's telling you, hey, there's some limitations. Um, I can't quite do it. Now, spoiler alert, 
it comes all the way down to the bottom and it craps out. But let's see what it came up with uh, before that. So the code I find is actually quite reasonable. So it knows that it needs to define separate classes for the actor. Uh, they need to derive from nn.module. Uh, one criticism I would levy here is that this doesn't uh, account for the possibility of using a GPU because there's no device selection and it doesn't send the network to the device. So there's no way to handle training on a GPU here. That's kind of a minor point. It does get the feed forward correct though. You pass the um, you pass the state through the first network, perform a ReLU activation, and then pass it to the second and get a soft max along the negative one dimension. That is correct. And then the critic is similarly also correct. It, and it also knows to call the super constructor, which is a good thing. It doesn't work without that. Uh, yesterday's solution actually had a separate agent class, I believe, that had the actor and critic networks as well as the um, actor and critic optimizers as well as an select action and update function it looked more like a solution that I would write. This looks more like a solution like you would find in the actual documentation from um, the PyTorch uh, tutorial. So that's interesting. So we do have our actor and critic instantiated, actor and critic optimizers. These are done correctly. Critic loss function. It did get this correct today. Yesterday, it crapped out Humiliation. the actual environment, which I found incredibly ironic because the Obviously, the OpenAI gym is an OpenAI product. I thought it was rather strange that it didn't know how to finish there, but whatever. And then it knows how to correctly set state and action dims, and then, you know, uh, iterating over a number of episodes. So a number of episodes here is undefined. Uh, it does know to uh, reset the environment to get the episode reward. and doesn't define max steps. This also isn't how I would do it. I would iterate until the episode is done. Then it says to convert to a tensor, get your action probs, uh, get the multinomial and select the action. Okay, fine, take your action, get your reward, convert your next step to a tensor, and then start calculating your critic loss. Okay, it's doing generally the right thing, but it stops right here at this line. I don't know, I don't think I'm missing anything here. I'm scrolling all the way down and nothing else comes up. So this thing is in fact crapping out on updating the critic, but I will give it credit. It made it further than it did uh, yesterday. So it is adapting overnight. This is quite interesting to me. Editor Phil here. Now, as I'm editing this, I do notice one other issue. So the value function for the next state should depend on whether or not that state is terminal. So there's no multiplication by say one minus done. No way to take into account if the next state is terminal. So that is a sort of fatal flaw in this. And I didn't notice this while I was going through the video. It will not work as it is currently written, even if it continues on to get fully functional code, because the next value depends on whether or not that state is terminal. Terminal states have a value of zero now, forever, and always. That's simply by definition, because the terminal state um, means that no future rewards follow, and so the discounted sum of those future rewards is precisely zero. All right, back to the video. So I think we've seen enough to reach some kind of conclusion around uh, ChatGPT. In its current form, it is obviously useful. It knows something, okay? It is clearly an advanced tool that has a place in your toolbox. You can use it to get started, but you really have to have some type of understanding of where you are, where you want to go, the nature of the task you're trying to solve. You can't go from beginner to expert just using this tool. Now, it probably wouldn't be realistic to expect such a thing anyway, but you should know upfront that it's just a tool to help you get started. You're still gonna have to fill in the gaps yourself. You're still gonna have to understand the problem you're trying to solve. There is still a place for you in the world as a programmer. Do not fear, this is not going to replace you, at least not yet. In five years, who knows? But for now, our jobs are safe. Now, another thing I need to point out is that perhaps I'm not doing a very good job of leading the agent, of, of leading the software. I just watched Jeff Heaton's video a little bit ago, and in it, he put in his assignments from his machine learning class. Now, the end result was still the same. The, the chat GPT still failed, but it did give better answers than what I'm seeing here. So perhaps there is some value knowing how to ask the proper question. So that is one thing I want you to take away from this. Two things, actually. The first thing is that... Uh, this is a tool to be used and it's not something to be disregarded, but to understand it's not going to be, you know, the end all be all to solving programming problems. You still have a job as a programmer. And two, the real value in a tool like this is going to lie in the questions that you ask it. I believe, and from what I'm seeing, 
that the types of questions you ask, the way in which you ask them can prompt the AI to give either a correct or non-correct answer. So you need to think very, very carefully about the questions you ask of this thing. It can act as a sort of oracle, but can only answer the questions in a certain kind of way. You have to get inside of its mind in some sense and know how to ask it the proper questions to get the answer you are looking for. So I hope that was helpful for you. Please explore ChatGPT. It's really easy to use. Come up with new use cases for it. Leave those down in the comments. If you found this entertaining, please let me know. And uh, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more content like this. And I'll see you in the next video.